we were just talking about uh, the global, the globally famous Lisa Ling, and I see her coming into our Zoom now. Lisa, how are you? How's it, how's it going? Well, it's going great. We were talking about you a couple shows ago um, because I'm obsessed with your new HBO Max series. <laughs> I see why you're hosting it because, uh, you know, you have roots in that culture. But yeah. it's really a job that I would have auditioned for myself <laughs> because I find it. It's called Take Out with Lisa Ling. Uh, I find so much interest in the history of food and the people that are behind that kind of history. And that's really what this show is about. Sure, you get to eat some cool stuff, but it's about finding out how it all came to be. It is, Ryan, and, and I'm so glad to hear that that's something that is of interest to you. I, I'm very specific about the fact that this isn't a cooking show, it's a food show, because yeah. frankly, I don't cook. Really? <laughs> and the reason, yeah. well, the reason I, I don't is because my grandmother never wanted me to cook, because for her, the restaurant was solely a means for survival. You know, my grandparents oh. came to America in the late 40s, even though they were both very educated. My grandfather got his undergrad at NYU in the early 30s and an MBA from University of Colorado. My grandmother had a degree from a, a university in England. But when they finally moved here in the late 40s, he couldn't get a job in finance because he was Chinese. And so they ended up doing a bunch of odd jobs and eventually scraped it, it, up enough money to open a Chinese restaurant. Neither of them had ever cooked before. Mm -hmm. And so they had to toil away in this restaurant they learned how to cook from you know these chinese cooks and and that became the pathway towards some semblance of the american dream and that's the story for so many immigrants in this country mm -hmm. not just asian americans but it's interesting because you talk about the history and over the last couple of years asians have been on the receiving end of a lot of scapegoating and violence in the wake of covid but when you really dig into the history there's been a, a long history of, of violence against Asians, but yet the food has somehow transcended all of that. But it was fast. I mean, I've seen several episodes. It was fascinating to me to as a food lover of New Orleans food. Right. I've been there for work and you go there and you eat. But I didn't truly understand the history of that food and how it came to New Orleans at the beginning. Well, it's true. I mean, New Orleans style food, particularly gumbo, which has become like an American staple, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of a hodgepodge of a lot of different flavors. Um, but interestingly enough, gumbo might not have shrimp in it if it weren't for the early Filipino settlers who jumped off Spanish galleons in the 1700s before the United States was even the United States, about 200 uh, men from the Philippines. They were either indentured servants or sailor sailors. And they, they built a life for themselves, not on the West Coast or East Coast, but in the bayous of Louisiana. And there's a town currently um, in Southern Louisiana called Jean Lafitte. And the mayor there, who's a blonde, blue-eyed guy, <laughs> mm -hmm. tells me that he believes that 70 to 80 percent of the population of his town has Filipino blood running through it, including himself. Yeah. Wow. Which is, it's it's so interesting when they... If you haven't seen this episode, they they dump out the the is it was it the shrimp boil or the oh yeah the the, the, the big deep boil <laughs> what they call it the bowl down there where they put the corn out and they just lay it all out on the table on newspapers mm -hmm. and you just go for it and you eat it with your hands yeah. and and you know that is what they do in the Philippines they oh. lay out food in what's called the kamayan on these banana leaves and everyone eats with their hands and so. The shrimp boil, and you know, many people now have experienced like a seafood boil where they just mm -hmm. kind of dump all the food out on a table. The parallels between that event that's become kind of a, an American cultural experience and what the Filipinos have always done is just like, it was uncanny to me. Yeah, it was cool to see. Lisa Ling with us. Take out with Lisa Ling is streaming on HBO Max. You actually went to Little Saigon uh, in Orange County and Little Tokyo in Boyle Heights. Tell me, I've not seen that yet. So tell me about that. Oh my gosh. So we did a whole episode in Boyle Heights, California, which mm -hmm. most people think of as more of a Latino community. And it is. Mm -hmm. But after the Japanese were released from prison camps after World War II, because 120,000 Japanese Americans were interned and uh, accused of spying on the U.S. government, they had lost everything. They lost their businesses and their homes. And so many of them settled in Boyle Heights because it was one of the only places 
that they could afford to live or were allowed to live. And so shortly after World War II, there was this thriving Japanese American community. And now there's only one Japanese restaurant still standing, but there are still these incredible vestiges of the Japanese community in Boyle Heights. And one of the pop-ups that we went to is this like Mexican Japanese fusion um, that started in Boyle Heights and their signature dish is a hot Cheeto misubi. You know, the misubi is the Japanese part, which is basically a rice ball and spam with hot <laughs> yeah. Cheetos on top, which is like the homage <laughs> to, her, to the, 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 the woman's Mexican roots. Um, and that's what in some ways Boyle Heights has, has come to um, represent, like this kind of just this melding of so many different cultures. And that one Japanese restaurant that's still standing there, it's called Otomi-san. Uh-huh. Um, the owner of it, the, the the Latino community considers her kind of their Japanese mom. Um, and it's just a really beautiful experience and episode. I think you'll something... like it. And since you're in LA a lot, you you you, yeah. you, you might will, enjoy checking the, out those restaurants. I will get the region and checking out the restaurants. Lisa, I want to, so you're going to host, you don't need me to do anything. You don't need like a sidekick for this at, at any point, <laughs> right? Like you're going to do it on your own? You know what, Ryan? I, I'd love to have you along. We have to convince HBO Max to greenlight another season, but I would love well, to have you along. Well, I'm going to keep talking about it, and maybe they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, <laughs> yeah. they'll, they'll do something about it. Uh, maybe we can be... do it back in Atlanta because I know you're from from Atlanta. Yeah, we could oh, do some cute. southern some southern mm-hmm. roots there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. please, well, I've known you for a long time, but I tell you that when your docu series is on CNN, it is some of the most unbelievable territory that you uncover and that you discover that no one does like you uh it's really it's i know it's a lot of work and it's sometimes it's probably tough but it's really powerful well thank you ryan i mean yeah you and i probably have known each other for over 30 years and we were just like these scrappy kids starting (laughs) in this business and and i am so proud of you i mean you've just become such a like a fixture (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in you. American households. And, you know, I love that you're still, you know, on the radio talking to people every day with the, these, you know, your beautiful co-hosts. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm so proud of you. Well, thank you. It is the same that I have for you. So uh, we'll keep talking about the uh, HBO series. Let me know if you get a season two and we'll do something. Be fun. Yeah. I would love that. I'd love that. Take good care of yourself, Lisa. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Lisa Ling Bye. there.